Hello, bears. Again, Mrs. Jacoby, so good to see you. I hope you're enjoying 39 Clues, The Maze of Bones. We are on chapter eight and our learning target again this chapter. I can ask and answer questions about key details in a text so I can understand it. Um, I have my couple of questions from chapter seven um, that came into my mind as I was reading. One was, what's the KGB that Irina worked for? Um, and what are the madrigals? This is the second time we've heard, beware the madrigals. So those were a couple of my questions. If you have answers to some of my questions, email me. All right, we're going to get into chapter eight. Amy knew something was wrong as soon as Nellie came out of the rental car place. She was frowning and holding a thick brown padded envelope. What is that? Amy asked. It's for you guys. Nellie held out the package. Somebody dropped it off at the counter this morning. That's impossible, Amy said. Nobody knew we'd be here. But as she said it, a chill went down her back. They booked the train tickets and the rental car online last night from their hotel using Nellie's name. Was it possible somebody tracked them down so fast? What'd the envelope say? Dan asked. For A and D Cahill, Nellie read, from W. McIntyre. Mr. McIntyre, Dan grabbed the package. Wait, Amy yelled. It could be a trap. Dan rolled his eyes. Come on, it's from, it could be from anybody, Amy insisted. It could blow up or something. Okay, whoa, Nellie said. Why would somebody send a couple of kids a bomb? And who's this McIntyre dude? Dan grinned. I say we let Nellie open it. Uh, no, Nellie said. You're the au pair. Aren't you supposed to diffuse explosives for us and stuff? I'm driving you, kiddo. That's enough. Amy sighed and snatched the package. She stepped into the parking lot, turned the flap of the envelope away from Nellie and Dan, and carefully peeled it open. Nothing happened. Inside was a metal cylinder like a flashlight, except the light was a strip of purple glass running down one side. A note was attached in sloppy handwriting like the writer had been in a hurry. Meet me at Independence Hall this evening at 8, but only if you find the information. W.N. P.S. Thank you for calling the ambulance. Find what information? Dan asked, reading over her shoulder. The next clue, I guess? What clue? Nellie demanded. Nothing, Dan and Amy said. Nellie blew a tuft of black and blonde hair out of her eyes. Whatever, stay right here. I'll bring the car around. She left them standing with the bags and Saladin and his new cat carrier. Saladin hadn't been too pleased with the cat carrier, any more than Nellie had been with the fresh red snapper they'd bought to keep him happy but Amy hadn't had the heart to leave him behind. Aww, Saladin asked. Amy reached down and scratched his head through the bars. Dan, maybe we shouldn't make that rendezvous. Mr. McIntyre told us not to trust anyone. But the note's from him. It could be a trick. That makes it even better. We've got to go. Amy twisted her hair. She hated it when Dan didn't take her seriously, and this could be dangerous. If we go, it says we have to find the information first. But you know where to look, right? You're smart and stuff. Smart and stuff. Like that's all they needed to track down a clue in a huge city. Before they'd left Boston, she'd splurged and bought some books about Franklin and Philadelphia from her friends at the used bookshop. She'd spent the whole train trip reading, but still, I've got a few ideas, she admitted. But I don't know where we're going in the long term. I mean, have you thought about what this ultimate treasure could be? Something cool. Oh, that's real helpful. I mean... What could make somebody the most powerful Cahill in history, and why 39 clues? Dan shrugged. 39 is a sweet number. It's 13 times 3. It's also the sum of five prime numbers in a row. 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. And if you add the first three powers of 3, 3 to the first power plus 3 to the second power plus 3 cubed, you get 39. Amy stared at him. How did you know that? What do you mean? It's obvious. Amy shook her head in dismay. Dan acted like a doofus most of the time. And then he'd pull something like that, adding prime numbers or powers of three that she never thought about. Their dad had been a mathematics professor, and Dan apparently had inherited all of his number sense. Amy had enough trouble remembering phone numbers. She held up the weird metal cylinder Mr. McIntyre had sent them and switched it on. The light glowed purple. What is that thing? Dan asked. I don't know, Amy said, but I have a feeling we better figure it out before 8 o'clock. Amy hated cars almost as much as she hated crowds. She promised herself that when she got older, she'd live somewhere where she'd never have to drive. 
Part of that was because she'd been in the car with Nellie before. Nellie had rented a Toyota Hybrid. She said it was more environmental, which was fine with Amy, but it cost $258 a day. And the way Nellie raced around corners and gunned the gas wasn't exactly green. They were on Interstate 95, heading into downtown, when Amy happened to look behind them. She wasn't sure why, a prickling sensation on her neck like she was being watched. In fact, she was. We're being followed, she announced. What? Dan said. Five cars back, Amy said. Gray Mercedes. It's the Starlings. A Starbucks? Nellie said excitedly. Where? Starlings, Amy corrected. Our relatives, Ned, Ted, and Samed. <laughs> Nellie snorted. That's not really their names. I'm not joking, Amy said. It's a uh, part of the scavenger hunt. Nellie, we can't let them follow us. We have to lose them. Nellie didn't need to be told twice. She yanked the wheel to the right, and the Toyota careened across three lanes of traffic. Saladin yelled. Just as they were about to slam into the safety impact barrels, Nellie slipped onto an exit ramp. The last view Amy got of the Starlings was Sinead's freckled face pressed against the window of the Mercedes, her jaw hanging open as she watched Amy and Dan get away. Is that lost enough? Nellie asked. Aww. Saladin protested. You could have killed us. Dan had a big grin on his face. Do it again! No, Amy said. Locust Street and hurry. Their first stop was the Library Company of Philadelphia, a big red brick building in the middle of downtown. Amy and Dan asked Nellie to wait in the car with Saladin. Then they walked up the front steps. Oh boy, another library, Dan said. We have such great luck with libraries. Franklin founded this place, Amy told them. It's got a lot of books from his personal collection. If we can convince the librarian deal with Benjamin Franklin anyway. I mean, so the guy invented electricity or whatever. That was hundreds of years ago. He didn't invent electricity, Amy said, trying not to sound too annoyed. He discovered that lightning was the same stuff as electricity. He invented lightning rods to protect buildings and experimented with batteries and ugh, I do that. Have you ever put one on your tongue? You're an idiot. The thing is, Franklin was famous for a lot of reasons. He started out getting rich with his printing business. Then he became a scientist and invented a bunch of stuff. Later, he helped write the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He was even an ambassador to England and France. He was brilliant, world famous. Everybody liked him. And he lived until he was like in his 80s. Superman, Dan said. Pretty much. So do you think he knew what it was, this treasure we're looking for? Amy hadn't thought of that. Franklin had been one of the most influential people in history. If he was a Cahill, and he knew about this secret family treasure, I think, she said, we'd better find out. She pushed open the doors and led Dan inside. As we're about halfway through the chapter, I want you to be thinking of these questions that you have. One that I have, I wonder what they're going to find in this library. Fortunately, the librarians were having a slow day, and Amy wasn't shy around them at all. She loved librarians. When she told them she was doing a summer research project on Benjamin Franklin and needed to use historical documents, they fell all over themselves to help her. They made Amy and Dan wear latex gloves and sit in a climate-controlled reading room while they brought out old books to look at. The librarian set the first one down and Amy gasped. This is Franklin's first cartoon. Dan squinted at it. The picture showed a snake cut into eight pieces, each one labeled with the name of an American region. Not very funny for a cartoon, Dan said. It's not supposed to be funny, Amy said. Back then, cartoons made a point. Like if he's, um, like he's saying, if the colonies don't get together, Britain will cut them apart. Uh-huh, Dan turned his attention to his computer. They'd been in the library maybe five minutes, and there he was, already looking bored, clacking away on his laptop rather than helping her. Amy poured over the other artifacts, a newspaper that had been printed on Franklin's own printing press, a copy of Pilgrim's Progress that Franklin had owned. So much amazing stuff, but what was she looking for? Amy felt pressured, and she didn't do well under pressure. Find what you need, the librarian asked. She had frizzy hair and bifocals and sort of looked like a friendly witch. <laughs> um, maybe some more, please? Anything that was important to Franklin? The librarian thought for a moment. Franklin's letters were important to him. He wrote many, many letters to his friends and family because he lived in Europe so long. I'll bring you some. She adjusted her glasses and left the room. Franklin invented those too, Amy said absently. 
Dan frowned. Librarians? No, bifocals. He cut up two sets of lenses and pasted them half and half so he could see long distance and short distance with the same pair. Oh, Dan didn't look impressed. He went back to playing on his laptop. He had the mystery flashlight from Mr. McIntyre in front of him, and he kept switching it on and off. The librarian brought them a stack of new stuff, including old letters preserved in plastic sheets. Amy read through them, but felt more hopeless than ever. Nothing jumped out at her. Nothing screamed clue. Suddenly, Dan sat up straight. I found it. You found what? She'd assumed Dan was playing games. But when he turned the laptop to face her, there was a picture of a flashlight just like the one Mr. McIntyre had sent them. It's a blacklight reader, Dan announced. Oh, the librarian said, very ingenious. We have those for our collection. Amy looked up. Why? What do they do? They reveal secret writing, the librarian said. During the Revolutionary War, spies would use invisible ink to send messages on documents that seemed harmless, like love letters or orders for merchants. The receiver would use heat or a special chemical wash to make secret words appear between the lines. Of course, we can't damage our documents by spraying chemicals on them, so we use blacklight to check for secret messages instead. Amy held up the blacklight reader. Can we? I can save you time, my dear, the librarian said. We check all our colonial documents as a matter of course. There are no secret messages, unfortunately. Amy's heart sank. They'd wasted their time here, and she still didn't know what she was looking for. She had a mental list of other places to visit, but it was very long. There was no way they could hit all of them before 8 o'clock. Secret messages. Franklin had written lots of letters to his friends and family while living in Europe. Follow Franklin. A crazy idea started to form in her head. Amy looked at the librarian. You said his letters were important to him. Is there any place else that keeps Franklin's letters on display? The librarian smiled. Funny you should ask. Some of his most famous handwritten documents are showing this month at the Franklin Institute down on the Science Museum. Amy shot to her feet. On 20th Street? Yes, the librarian looked startled. But how did you? Thanks, Amy rushed out of the room with Dan right behind her. Amy always seems to have a plan. It was a quick drive to the Franklin Institute. Nellie wasn't too thrilled to sit in the car with the cat again, but Dan and Amy convinced her they wouldn't be too long. They ran inside and found a 20-foot tall white marble statue of Benjamin Franklin gazing down at them from a giant chair in the entry chamber. Holy almanacs, Dan said. That's a big bin. Amy nodded. At the end of his life, he was so heavy, he had to be hauled around in a sedan chair carried by four big convicts. Sweet, Dan said. I want a sedan chair. You weigh 90 pounds. Resolution, start eating more ice cream. Just come on. The museum was huge. They walked past the memorial and through the ticket area, then followed the map into the Franklin Gallery. It was already late in the afternoon, and the place was pretty much deserted. Check this out. Dan picked up a mechanical arm and grabbed Amy's wrist with it. Stop that, she said. Franklin made that for getting things off high shelves, not annoying your sister. I bet if he had a sister. He did have a sister. Dan, we need to find his letters. Stop messing around. They kept walking. They found a display of Franklin's lightning rods, a bunch of bifocals, and one of his batteries for generating electricity, a wooden crate full of glass jars, all wired together. That thing's huge, Dan said. What is that, like a double Z battery? Whoa, what is that? He ran over to another display. Inside was a mahogany box holding a row of closely fitted glass saucers, like a stack of cereal bowls. It's an harmonica. Amy said, reading the description. It makes music by rubbing water on the rims of the glasses. Awesome. Franklin invented that? Yeah. It says here it was really popular for a while. Lots of famous composers wrote music for... <gasps> Amy froze. A tall, gray-haired man had just crossed the hallway in the next gallery, heading toward the information desk. And he was wearing a black suit. What? Dan asked. Man in black, Amy murmured. Run. She grabbed her brother's hand and they fled deeper into the gallery. They didn't stop until they were two rooms away, hiding behind a large glass sphere that showed the solar system. What's he doing here? Amy fretted. Duh, Dan said. The fire didn't work, so he's here to get us. We can't go out the main exit. 
He'll be waiting to jump us as soon as we try. Amy looked around nervously for another way out. Then she noticed what was on the wall right next to them. Documents. Cases full of documents. All yellowing parchment written in spidery handwriting. Franklin's letters, she said. Quick, the blacklight reader. Dan fumbled in his backpack and brought out the light. They held it up to the first letter and shone it through the glass. The document seemed to be some kind of request for supplies. It started, Sir, I wrote to you lately via New York, which I hope may come to hand. I have only time now to desire you to send me the following items. Please, one dozen Cole's English Dictionaries, three dozen Mother's Young Man's Companion, one Iron Solute, two Quarter Wagners for America. Purple light passed over the paper. Nothing happened. Next, Amy said. She was sure the man in black was going to burst in on them any second. Whoa, Dan said. Amy gripped his arm. You found it? No, but look, this whole essay? To the Royal Academy? He wrote a whole essay on farts. Dan grinned with delight. He's proposing a scientific study on different fart smells. You're right, Amy. This guy was a genius. Dan, you're such a dweeb. Keep searching. They scanned four more documents written by Franklin. Nothing showed up. Then, on the fifth one, Dan said, here. Thankfully, it wasn't another fart essay. The letter was something Franklin had written in Paris in 1785 to someone named Jay. Amy didn't know what it was about. She didn't have time to read it, but glowing yellow in the black light beam were lines between the lines, a secret message in the handwriting of Benjamin Franklin. Soon I must leave this place of wonder, but I leave behind what hath driven my clan asunder. Below, drawn by hand, was a crest with two snakes coiled around a sword. Amy gasped. That's one of the crests from Grace's library, the one with the L. Franklin must have been a Lucian. So this is the second clue, Dan asked, or a clue to the clue. A camera clicked away. Either way, a girl's voice said, nice job. Amy turned and found herself surrounded by the starlings. They wore identical preppy clothes as usual, khakis, button downs, and loafers. Sinead's brown hair was tied in a ponytail. Her brothers, Ted and Ned, stood on either side of her, smiling in an unfriendly way. Sinead was holding her cell phone, which she obviously just used to take a picture of their clue. You lost us pretty well on the highway, she admitted. Fortunately, there were only so many Franklin sites you could have been heading to. Thanks for the clue. She snatched the blacklight reader away from Dan. Now listen close. You brats are going to stay in the museum for half an hour. Give us a head start or we'll be forced to tie you up. If you leave early, I promise Ted and Ned will find out about it and they won't be happy. Her two brothers grinned evilly. Sinead turned to leave, but Amy blurted out, Wait! Sinead raised an eyebrow. There's a man. Amy tried to say more, but the starlings were all glaring at her. She felt like she'd been submerged in ice water. What man? She asked. He's been watching us, Dan said, following us. It isn't safe to go out the main entrance. Sinead smiled. You're concerned for our safety? That's very cute, Dan, but the thing is, she leaned in and poked him in the stomach with every word. I don't believe you. Sinead and her brothers laughed and then turned and jogged toward the main entrance. Before Amy could even think what to do, a low, horrible hum shook the floor. And then, boom. Glass display cases shattered. The whole building shuddered. Amy was thrown against Dan and they crumbled to the floor. When she sat up, her vision was fuzzy. She wasn't sure how long she stayed there dazed. She staggered to her feet and tugged on Dan's arm. Get up, she said, but she couldn't hear her own voice. What? He mouthed. She hauled him to his feet. Together, they ran toward the exit. Smoke and dust filled the air. Emergency lights flashed from the fire alarms. A pile of rubble blocked the exit from the Franklin Gallery as if part of the ceiling had collapsed. On the floor near Amy's feet lay the shattered black light reader and Sinead's cell phone. And there was no sign of the starlings at all.
All right, so jot down a couple of questions about chapter eight, and we'll see what happens in chapter nine.